We're in the second year of the second edition of Warcry, Warhammer Age of Sigmar's fast-paced tabletop skirmish game. We're still in the beastly realm of Gur, within the Gnarlwood, the belligerent, meaty forest which hates you and everything you stand for. Or rather, wants to eat you and everything you stand for. <laughs> Bucking the trend of big meat tree choked chonk in boxes, we've been introduced to a much more granular selection this time around. And in this video, I will be exploring and comparing Warcry Hunter and Hunted and Warcry Ravaged Land Scales of Talaxis. The former pitches the gruesome, hulking, tusk studded, eternally hungry Gorge and Moor packs against the Wildercore Hunters, who are just some regular blokes and their dogs. And these scales of Talaxis give us an entirely new set of scenery, boards and tokens. It's digging into a swampy Narwood location and is laced with some really funky new scenery rules, offering the biggest single change up to gameplay of this entire edition of the game. In this video, I'll be cracking open the boxes, digging into the new format, discussing the strange new happenings within the Narwood, and ultimately answering the question, which of the latest releases is for you? This video is sponsored by the bestest boys and girls in the Hobby Jackal community. Try and spot them throughout this video. For those that are curious, this is a neatly packaged box, shown here in comparison to other Warcry releases, other box games, and some beans. So, what's in the box? What's in the box? First up, we have the Moor Pit, neatly contained on a single sprue. It may be the only terrain piece in this box, but it is an absolute doozy. This thing is absolutely massive. And here it is against some other terrain to give you an idea of the scale. It's a solid piece and the details are really crisp, but what exactly is a Moor Pit? Written in 2004 and released in 2005, the first Moor Pit entered Warhammer lore as the Ogre Kingdom stomped onto tables of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. A fanged comet potentially summoned by the Astromancers of Cathay plummeted into the Warhammer world, desolating a third of the completely lovely and innocent ogre population. Those ogres that made a pilgrimage to the site of the impact found a giant gaping crater the size of an inland sea, filled with ridge upon ridge of jagged teeth and rippling muscle that stretched down and down into nothingness. It was also rumoured a similarly vast whirlpool existed on the opposite side of the world where the comet had burst forth. Clearly the ogres were not adherent to a flat warmer world theory. I have to cut that actually because the flat world would still have a hole on the other side. Fast forward a few millennia or so, and the echoes of the Ogre Kingdom's race find themselves in the mortal realms of the Age of Sigmar, known as the Ogor Moor tribes, and they still have a pretty uneasy relationship with their gulping god. To bring you up to speed on Warcry lore, the Warhammer world exploded, a new world was born from its sparkly remnants, and a lizard-operating star-faring vessel plummeted into an area which would one day become known as the Narwood, causing the plants and critters there to grow with rapacious speed, whilst also depositing magical treasures, which are shiny enough to lure anyone from across the mortal realms away from their cozy bed or lair in search of wealth or power. Folk have been entering this belligerent forest in search of loot and dying by the dozen, and all has been lovely and well until now. Tremors have begun to rack the Narwood and great holes have ripped open in the ground, devouring swathes of vegetation and sending the unwary plunging to their doom. Narloks! Sentient meaty trees are uprooting themselves to escape the disturbance, and also ambushing those attempting the same. This may come as no surprise, but those holes are more pits, with the smallest barely capable of biting off a human foot, and the largest so vast that it can swallow entire buildings in a single gulp. They are tooth-lined pits, some with yellowing fangs, others with rock-like protrusions matching the earth they tore open from. Screeching with hunger, long tongues erupt from these chasms, lacking back and forth obscenely to grab and drag anything into their grinding gullets. Lovely, now you get to play with one of these in your games of Warcry. Next we have the bases, ever useful for helping your miniatures to stand up, and you'll find the nigh essential size comparison guide in the building instructions book, which we'll be taking a look at later. Now what do we have here? The Gorge and Moor Pack provide us with five sizable models and more build options than I was expecting. These models are absolutely fantastic and great fun to build, and we'll take a look at their build instructions and stats as we dig a little bit deeper. But in the meantime, what is a Gorge or a Gorge and Moor Pack? Also originating from the world that was the Gorges of today are ogres struck with the worst fate an ogre can imagine, endless tormenting hunger, which is known imaginatively as the Empty Belly Curse. 
The curse withers away their ample guts, leaving them as hollow, starving vessels unable to satisfy their gluttonous urges for even a moment. Understandably, such a fate causes all but the strongest of will to lose every ounce of their sanity. Whilst the cause of or even means of contracting the curse is unknown, ogres suspect and attribute it to the disfavour of their gulping god. The cursed, pale, loping gorges are both outcasts from ogre society and rightly feared by them. The creatures lope and scuttle along on all fours, shrieking and growling in constant agony, and feasting on any detritus their grime wedge claws can grasp. Increasingly, whether inspired by the growing numbers of Moorpits or the era of the beast itself, gorgers have begun gathering in groups known as Moorpacks, and for the first time in the records of the mortal realms, these savage and desperate beasts have been seen wielding crude stolen weaponry. A worrying trend indeed for any who might come face to face with a gorger. Next we have the world of core hunters, poised to hunt or if they're particularly unfortunate be hunted by the Gorger Moorpax. This sprue is absolutely bloody amazing and produces some fab new miniatures for use in Age of Sigmar or, you know, more time maybe. And is going to be mighty tempting for folk to want to pick up more than just one box to make all the options that you've got in here. We'll dig into this more as we get into their build instructions and stats, but first, who are they? As the cities of Sigmar increasingly march out in Dawnbringer Crusades, Attempting to reclaim the realms, their chosen routes are determined by a key subdivision of their forces. Known as Wildercor Hunters, they are experts in reconnaissance, skirmish operations and pathfinding. Unlike the stolid shield sluggers of the frontline formations, the Wildercore travel light and move fast, eschewing protection in favour of agility and stealth. The life of a Wildercore Hunter is a hard one, even by Dawnbringer standards. When the balance of power shifts against them, the Wilder Corps fade into the shadows, sacrificing soldiers where necessary to delay the enemy and ensure the message of imminent danger is relayed to the main force. Despite the dangers they face, they never have a shortage of new recruits, in large part because of the autonomy offered to them, unthinkable amongst the other ranks of the Free Guild. Perhaps the most vital tool in the arsenal of these expert trackers is their trail hounds. Good boys and girls all. Legendarily bad-tempered and near-rabid to the casual observer, they are intensely loyal and intelligent, capable of covering many miles at full speed, and able to sneak upon a cruel boy sentry and rip out their throat with barely a sound. <coughs> so next we have a piece of card. It's, it's pretty much blank in comparison to what you usually get, and it is useful for constructing a fancy hat or yeeting at an enemy. Huzzah! Here are the cards, one of my favourite aspects of the Warcry game. First up we have the Battle Plan cards. These are four decks which allow you to randomly draw up a unique game in seconds. You'll draw terrain which will indicate how to set up your board, deployment to show you where each player's fighters will begin, victory to tell you how to win the game, and twist which throws in a random rule to change things up. This set contains six terrain cards and all of them assume you already have access to the scales of Talaxis board and scenery. They combine with the more pit in this set and will have little use to you if you only have this particular box. With the only purpose I can think of for these cards potentially being used to randomly determine where the more pit will show up on your board. You get 12 deployment cards, 6 are symmetrical where both players deploy in exactly the same way which is particularly well suited to match play in competitive games, and 6 asymmetrical which are a great deal of fun and I find much more narratively thematic for a skirmish in the dangerously wild Narwood. You get 12 themed victory cards all appropriately brutal including survival where one player's warband is halved at the very start of the game and their remaining warband needs to survive 4 rounds to win, or savage ritual where a terrain feature the more pit is recommended, becomes a ritual site which the attacker gains points for taking out nearby defending fighters. Finally, you have 12 twist cards, including inimical enzymes, which allocate 3 points of damage to any fighters on the ground from round 2 onwards. Ouch. And... Roaring more pit! which prevents fighters from using abilities and reactions when within 3 inches of the more pit. As ever, all these cards have consistent backing and design and can be mixed with any other cards from this edition of Warcry seamlessly, or with the first edition accounting for the different coloured backs of the cards. Next we have the fighter cards. The Gorge and Warpack come with a slimline 5 fighter types, although that's not bad going for a warband where you're only ever likely to field 5 fighters in match play. They are meaty beasts, having a standard profile of 5 movement, toughness 3, which admittedly on the lower side, and 30 wounds, with their leader, the Clawback, having 35 wounds. A particular quirk of this warband is the fact that all but the Clawback have the beast room mark. This means they cannot move through closed doors, presumably just sort of whinging at it and slapping at it like a cat. 
cannot pick up treasure and cannot use monster hunting abilities. This represents their insatiable hunger. But when we get to the abilities cards, we will see that they have some tricks up their sleeves or lack of sleeves to overcome this. In contrast to this, the Warder Corps have an incredibly generous 11 fighter options, including three for their hero slash leader option alone. In general, your human fighters will be running about at an average to low movement of four, toughness three, and 10 to 12 wounds, aside from your leader who's sitting pretty at 20. Your faithful hounds pick up the pace a bit at movement six, but are fragile with only six wounds. Lastly, you'll get three of these cards, which are used for denoting wounds where you have multiple fighters of the same type. However, me and my chums tend to just throw wound counters on the board wherever possible, or dice. <coughs> Next, we have the Warband Tome Hunter and Hunted. It rocks in at 65 pages, which is exactly the same as in previous offerings. Equally, the contents follow the same tried and tested format. You'll start with some flavor text, a brief intro to this book, and some fantastically dark full page art. Next, you have a 16 page lore section covering the latest quakey developments in the Narwood, the Gorger Moor Packs, and the Wardcore Hunters, already touched upon in this video. I'll also cover these in greater detail in future videos as I've started doing lore content. And before we move on, it's worth touching upon this map. Previous Warband Tomes developed and added to the same map of the Narwood. It actually provided really clear hints as to what was to come in future Warcry releases and was great fun for speculation. This Warband Tome changes things up with a more zoomed in map. Whilst there's no obvious hints towards the next release, it does help emphasize the sheer scale of this forest. We have some glorious miniature photography to inspire your painting and modeling efforts, and then we're into the rules. The first section is useful for all playstyles. It contains the faction rules, which are a direct copy of the info contained on your fighter and ability cards, and the rules for using the more pit in your games. If the more pit's on the board, it opens up a new reaction and triple ability to all fighters. While you're near the more pit, the reaction Desperate Gambit allows fighters to insta kill an opponent that's attacking them if every one of their attacks misses. And the triple ability, get in the pit allows fighters to target a lower wounds enemy fighter to potentially instantly kill them by getting them into the pit. After the attack, they get to roll a dice, add their strength to this number, and if they get an eight or more, the target is taken down. Additionally, narrative gamers benefit from a King of the Hills style bonus where you gain extra stuff for being the only fighter stood on the bone platform above the gnar pit at the end of the game which in my opinion is a really nice touch and actually does give you a reason to have your fighters hanging about this horrible toothed gob in the middle of the table. The Deadly Expedition section includes narrative gaming content, which is where, in my opinion, Warcry really shines. The Gorger Moor Pack and Wildercore Hunters each get three Warband-specific narrative quests to embark upon, granting artifacts of power, or Butcher's Bounty plundered trophies, heroic traits, and the chance to secure a unique encampment location for your warbands, in the form of the delightfully sounding Oozing Midden, or rather practical sounding Forward Base. Points for guessing which of those is for who. All this content is brilliantly thematic, with the more pack making offerings to a butcher and growing their offering score by securing powerful items, such as the faux hide cloak, which increases the gorgeous toughness, or the Nalhorn talisman, which disables the fighter from making reactions, but adds two to melee attacks once they've taken five damage, making them a tricky combatant your opponent may wish to avoid. In turn, the Wildercore Hunters gain heroic traits by achieving the Born Survivor quest, where they build a survivor score by simply having their warbands survive enough battles. The traits include the Can't Keep Them Down, which allows a fighter to make a disengage ability for free, and the ability to avoid damaging injury rolls, which is super useful if this is your leader. After these, we find a brand new quest format for the Wildercore Hunters called a Quest Chain. All this means is that you need to complete each quest in turn, ending in a cinematic and unique rescue mission based around, but not limited to, the fantastic Fusil Major, an Ogre Warhulk model for the Cities of Sigmar range. We end this section on two creative campaign arcs, which, in my opinion, are improvements on previous offerings. Rather than being narratively tied to the two warbands in the box fighting each other, we have an arc each where it's one of the warbands versus any opponent. I particularly like the Moorpack arc, which contains a who is hunting who table, where players make pre-game decisions in a kind of strategic rock, paper, scissors, with in-game bonuses awarded based on the results. Nice. We then have print versions of the previously seen battle plan cards, covering the deployment, victory and twist decks and providing dice numbers to randomly roll them up. And as ever, for those familiar with Warcry, we end on background tables, helping you to name your fighters, determine their origins and flesh out the background of your noble or hungry leader. The Moorpack entertainingly has skipped last names altogether to focus on ravenous exploits of their fighters, because hungry folk do not need surnames, as I yell whenever booking a table at a restaurant. <laughs> 
So next we have the build instructions, and this is possibly the least exciting thing to get two copies of, but I got a duplicate. So, you know, if you live in Devon, you can have one of these, and I'll release a treasure map to where you can find it on Dartmoor. So, right, it's a weird thing to say, but the build instructions in this set are one of the highlights for me. Or rather, how very flexible they show these sprues to be. Starting with the World of Core Hunters, these are an absolute delight for a hobbyist. Every single human model, aside from the Trailblazer, comes with a helmeted or unhelmeted head option. And as you can see here on the first page, and touched on with the fighter cards, you have three distinct hero options for this warband. This is previously completely unheard of in bespoke Warcry warbands. We've got a great mix of weapon options, all of which impact how your fighters play in the game. And there's also a really healthy gender mix. You'll also get three little weird dudes prancing straight out of a medieval manuscript. Their background isn't given anywhere in this set, but the new Cities of Sigmar battle tome does explain that they're known as Gargoylians. They're a weird quirk of the army which may or may not be chimeric critters drawn towards the faithful, manifestations of the realm's rage, or somehow related to the Incarnates. Whatever they are, they are benevolent towards the peoples of the Cities of Sigma, if just a little bit annoying at times. On to the Gorge and War pack, and I wasn't expecting much in the way of options here with five big boys squashed into the sprue. Yet, as we see here on the leader, every single hand weapon has an interchangeable weapon head, which is a neat sculpting choice. And after the Clawback and the Cave Howler, the three remaining Gorges have multiple options. One can have a great club or go unarmed, and the other two can be unarmed or armed with clubs. Their weapons utilize the same interchangeable club and axe heads. And did I mention these three models have a possible six heads to choose from, including great nods to the original and only sculpt from 2005. We are spoilt, and as an Ogres fan, the sheer numbers of options gave me multiple pauses while building these things. We end on the Moor Pit, which as I've already touched one is a chunky beast. Mine had warped ever so slightly, so I really had to hold it together while gluing. But the teethy adornments fit together perfectly. Lastly, but definitely not leastily, we have the ability cards for both warbands. Abilities turn this simple game system which could have risked being really one-dimensional into something quite special. Warbands roll a set of dice at the start of each round and use these grouped into doubles, triples and quads to pay for special bonuses or abilities. Additionally, each warband has its own reaction which can be used as specified on their card by forfeiting one of their two activations that round. The Will to Cause reaction and quad ability grant additional disengage or movement actions, and their remaining abilities offer a good amount of versatility. Especially if you choose to include the Wilder Core Warden with Grizzled Trailhound, who unlocks the Triple Kill, which allocates damage three times the number of doggos in close proximity to a visible enemy. Ouch. As touched on previously, the Gorge and Pack are pretty nasty, including a reaction that doles out six damage in return to a melee attack that fails to roll a critical, and a number of abilities that just make them better at hanging on to enemies and causing them immense damage. They also have a double glimmer of consciousness that allows fighters to overcome the beast room mark, which disallows them from doing things like carrying treasure, for the turn when it's used at least. If not used again, they will presumably just start gnawing on the treasure or sitting next to it, yelling. As a nice addition, we also get a card featuring the universal abilities and reactions. I do believe the quad isn't reflective of the latest errata, these may have been designed quite a while ago, but this is the first time these have appeared as cards since the first edition, and are always handy. Which brings us to the end of this box. <coughs> Next we're on to Ravage Land Scales of Talaxis, and as mentioned back in the intro, this box changes up gameplay far more than I imagined it would. For the curious amongst you, here's how it stacks up against previous Warcry offerings, including a Ravaged Lands box from the first edition, some other board games, and an egg. Chicken egg. So the Sunder Scales are so named for the scale-like spines and spires of debris left from the crashing Seraphon Voidship, originally known as the Eye of Chotek, but increasingly as Talaxis or the Ravening Ruin. This swamp-covered heart of the forest is rumoured to be the gateway to the Vault of Golden Wonders which lays at the heart of the ruined vessel. So, what's in the box? What's in the f***ing box? It is Chocker, and first up are the build instructions. I only got one set this time. If anything, I'd say these were easier builds than the previous Gur offerings. But I will note there's only one point in here where it warns you to paint before gluing, whereas I found there are multiple instances where you might want to consider doing so. As we continue to dig through this box when met with the scenery itself, you might be wondering where the rules are for the scenery. Well, they're not in this box, but they do exist, along with full narrative rules for this set. This content previously appeared in Warband Tomes, but as we've 
entered a different format this year, there's no tone produced alongside the scenery. This time around, the scenery rules, which are ample, have been released as a free PDF on the Warhammer community website, link down below. And the ample narrative rules have been bundled into White Dwarf 493, alongside narrative content for the Cruel Boys Monster Killers and the Vulcan Flame Seekers. On to the scenery. First up is the Elder Narlok. This carnivorous tree has been suffused with predatory cunning, thanks to the delectable fluids of the Seraphon spawning pools. For the first time ever, we're getting a good look at a Narlok gob, and it's actually creepier than I imagined. As for rules, we get the standard description as to which bits go with which standard Warcry rules, and also mention of a trove. I'll get to these rules when we look at the scatter terrain, but let's just focus on the meaty tree for a moment. So at the start of the game, each Elder Narlok is slumbering, and word in the forest is their snores are actually quite adorable. At the end of each battle round, roll a dice. If the roll's equal to or lower than the battle round, it wakes up. Now, you don't want to be near a Narlok when it wakes up. When they do, those stood on the platforms or an attached bridge have to take a fall test, with an increased chance of impact damage and instant death if there's nowhere for them to fall. The players then roll off, the winner picks a point on the battlefield within 6 inches of the Narlok, and anyone within 6 inches of this point takes d6 damage. Now there are no rules to suggest what happens with this Narlok after it's done this wake up attack, so it's unclear if you can't climb it or stand on the platforms again, but I'm assuming as a house rule you might not want to do that. And I'm even tempted to give it some stats like the Chaotic Beasts in the first edition of Warcry and have them wandering about chomping on people at random. Next, the idol of Motsul Pota. So, for those unfamiliar, Motsul Pota was the Slan Star Master in charge of the Eye of Chotek before it plummeted into Gur. It wasn't his fault and Zinch shenanigans happened, so I might do a follow-up lore video on the whole events that caused this thing to happen, as I haven't seen anybody actually covering that. His idol is said to crackle with unpredictable energy, and whilst its true purpose is unknown, it's said intrepid warriors have harnessed the power within. We have the usual blurb, and then we get the rules for Motsul Pater's gaze. A fighter within one inch of the idol can attempt to harness the celestial energy lashing from it. You can use a double to infuse of energy, roll a dice, on a five you get to pick one of your doubles, triples or quads, and change the number shown on the dice. If your fighter is a priest or a mystic, you can add one to that dice roll. It's a bit niche to be honest, costing a double and not having a brilliant rate of success. So in my moderately strategic mind, I think it's probably only really worth it if you've got something that really relies on that number, like a quad six that does something horrible. <laughs> Next we have two sprues of scatter terrain. These are pretty standard for the most part, with the rules clarifying what acts as a platform, an obstacle, or deadly terrain. The jars of Quetzal included here and below the Elder Narlok count as troves. If you're within one inch of these, you can use the double ransack. Roll a dice, on one to two you take d3 damage, on three to four remove three damage, and on five to six gain a wild dice. And going back to Warhammer Fantasy Battles and the Lizardmen, Quetzal the Protector was a god of protection and warriors. And entering the Age of Sigmar, Quetzal takes on a similar role in the Pantheon, being named Quetzal the Preserver, God of Protection, the Physical World, and Lord of Warriors and Guardians. There you go, a little history lesson for you. The rope bridge rules are exactly the same as in previous releases, aside from the additional clarification that if they're placed at a steep angle, you might want to consider them ladders. In short, objectives, treasures, and tokens can't be placed on them, and fighters can use an action to attempt to cut them down whilst within an inch of them. If it's destroyed, fighters must take a boosted impact damage roll just like when they wake a Narlok. We end on the Starfire Pylon, the centerpiece of this box. This piece is big, uh, really easy to build, and looks brilliant. It's a mysterious Seraphon Old One Relic, which is now damaged and malfunctioning, threatening mortal peril to those that will go up and poke it. We get the usual clarifications and then some rules which interact directly with the new swampy boards. This will be familiar to those of you that picked up Red Harvest, all the associated Ravaged Lands boxes, and it riffs a little on the Delve Engine rules. Any swampy feature within one inch of the pylon becomes a spawning pool. They can be dormant, or they can be energized. They'll generally start the game dormant and have no additional rules when in this state. Once energized, however, the pools become deadly terrain, instantly killing any fighters going for a little paddle. Zap! If you want your pool energized, you gotta go up and poke that pylon. To activate it, you wanna get within one inch of the neat control panel and do one of the following. You can use a double to do a rush deciphering. You roll a dice. On a one to three, the spawning pool becomes dormant. On a four to six, they become energized. If you energize a pool that's already energized, you take d6 damage. Using a triple allows you to attempt a cautious deciphering. 
roll a number of dice equal to the value of the ability dice you're using, and the same rules from Rush Deciphering apply, but this time around you can choose one of the dice rolled and apply that result. Now throughout, these terrain pieces feel like improvements on what's come before on the Gerish theme. It's like the original sculptor had a chance to put into action everything they learned for the first time around, or a new sculptor's come in benefiting from that groundwork. This is seen on the level of detail with dangly bits throughout and the bamboo platforms having much more irregular organic shapes. Not to mention a Narlok that's actually got a mouth visible. Ugh. Once again, we've got a generic card to protect the papery bits from the pokey bits. Yeet! And then we have cards. You are getting 12 terrain cards, six for each side of the board, which we'll take a look at in a moment. As touched on earlier, these cards are a brilliant element of the Warcry game and allow you to swiftly set up a new challenge with endless variety. The only potential negative is that none of these cards mix with any of the scenery released during the Heart of Gur season, which is a little bit of a shame given they've chosen to stay with the same aesthetics, but understandable given the volume of different releases at this point. And just remember, there's nothing stopping you mixing and matching existing scenery in your collection to create interesting boards. Now we have tokens, which have become a bit of a treasure in Warcry releases as they've not been consistently available. And alright, there's a slightly iffy starter set available now. So these do make one small key change to previous offerings which I haven't seen folk pick up on, and that's that the treasure tokens are numbered. It'll be interesting to see if this comes into play in future releases. The boards themselves are absolutely glorious, and I say this having found the previous four sets of boards released through the Heart of Gear to be... okay, very brown. The swampy areas add a real pop of colour and interest, and as ever, the quality of these is top notch. You're getting two distinct sides, which as touched upon earlier, link to six potential terrain setups, if you're using the cards found in the box. So about these boards, these swamps of the Sundered Scales are turgid, cloying environments that sap the stamina and drain the strengths of blows made by those within them. If a fighter is wholly within a swampy bit, they suffer minus one toughness and minus one strength to melee attacks. And that's if someone's not messing around with a pylon and energizing it to frazzle them. And that's the end of the box, it's the perfect size for a cat, or rather spacious if you own a hedgehog. Right, so this is the final bit of the video, so let me help you decide which of these releases might be for you. Across Warcry and Age of Sigmar communities, it's generally Warcry warbands themselves that get people most excited. Whether they like the aesthetics or the playstyle, are intending to add them to an existing collection, or try out a new force or paint scheme on a smaller scale, it's likely everyone will find a warband or several which appeal to them. Here there are three releases featuring four warbands, and a key decision maker for you could simply be which one do you like? Box contents aside, it's almost certain that Hunter and Hunted Warbands will get a separate release around January or February 2024, so if it's just a Warband or two you're after, you could bear that in mind. Which leaves us with scenery and play content. In addition to the Warbands, Hunter and Hunted contains the Moor Pit scenery piece, and the Warband tome also named Hunter and Hunted. The Moor Pit may particularly appeal to Ogre Moor Tribe's Age of Sigmar players or scenery completionists, and it is an eye-catching central piece. As a number of websites have shared the Moor Pit rules online, the Warband Tome only really adds value if you enjoy background, or if you play narratively and wish to play one of the two Warbands contained within. If you are brand new to Warcry, want to bolster your scenery collection, or just really like the look of the stuff in Scales of Talaxis, then this could be the box for you. I've reviewed other box releases separately, and only some contain the token sheets. This is one of those rare few, so for me that's a bit of a bonus. Outside of this release you need to hunt down Heart of Gur or Ravaged Lands Narwood Watch Camp, or the Warcry Star. Set. The last one of which I've touched upon, but well, it's it's just okay. By other Games Workshop starter sets, it doesn't offer a great deal of value when you look to something like the current Kill Team starter box. And it also contains a ruler which doesn't measure inches correctly, which... poor show. However, that said, Scales of Talaxis will pair nicely with that box if you really like the look of it or you've already picked it up. The only thing you'll really be lacking at this point is some more elevated scenery pieces to play across, and well, at the moment, eBay is pretty flush with a load of Narlocks, so you could just go and grab one or two if you wanted to spruce up your table. So you're not a new player, is Scales of Talaxis for you? Well, maybe. If you picked up a couple of the Heart of Gur season boxes, you'll already be well served with the Narwood aesthetic. Pleasingly, this box does mix things up up a fair bit, leaning further towards the Talaxis slash Eye of Chotek Seraphon ruin elements and pumping in a host of new rules. If you like the look of it, it is a decent box set and the boards and scenery mix things up nicely. Finally, I will re-emphasize the rules for scales of Talaxis terrain are entirely free, so there's nothing stopping you playing around with them, applying them to different bits of scenery already on your table and just using them without picking up this box. And it's always fun to imaginatively use bits and pieces from your own collection. <laughs> Right, thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you've enjoyed it and please do feel free to like and subscribe if you have. Do check out the other reviews which are popping up on your screen right now and cheers for stopping by. Have a lovely day. Take care.